Remember, remember the 5th of November. Gunpowder, treason and plot. These words have echoed through history for more than 400 years, reminding us of one of the most infamous events in British history, the Gunpowder Plot of 1605. Most of us know the story of Guy Fawkes and the failed attempt to blow up the Houses of Parliament. But what if I told you there's more to the story than meets the eye? Today, we're diving into five things you didn't know about the Gunpowder Plot. Get ready for a journey through secrets, conspiracies, and the untold tales that history often overlooks. The Gunpowder Plot of 1605 was an audacious and deadly conspiracy aimed at blowing up the Houses of Parliament during the state opening on November 5th, with the intent of assassinating King James I, the Prince of Wales, and many other key figures in the government. The goal was to place James's nine-year-old daughter, Elizabeth Stuart, on the throne, where she could be more easily influenced by the plotters' Catholic ideologies. The conspirators, led by a man named Robert Catesby, were driven by a deep-seated religious motive, rooted in the friction between the Protestant king and the Catholic dissidents. To fully understand why Guy Fawkes and his 12 co-conspirators wanted to commit such an act of treason, we need to look back before 1605. England had been a staunchly Catholic nation since the time of William the Conqueror, and arguably even earlier, up until the reign of King Henry VIII. The seeds of the gunpowder plot were sown during Henry's reign, particularly starting in 1527, with what was known as the King's Great Matter. Catholic King Henry VIII sought to divorce his wife Catherine of Aragon in order to marry Anne Boleyn, a Protestant. Henry's desire to remarry and his exposure to new Protestant ideas through Anne and reformers like Thomas Cranmer and Thomas Cromwell led to a significant religious shift in England. Under Henry, England broke away from the Vatican and the Catholic Church, establishing the Protestant Church of England. This allowed Henry to annul his marriage to Catherine, but it also caused profound religious upheaval. Despite initiating this break, Henry himself remained a Catholic in many ways, and for the rest of his reign. England balanced precariously between Catholicism and Protestantism. Straying too far in either direction could result in execution for heresy. When Henry died in 1547, his son Edward VI, a devout Protestant, took the throne and enforced a stricter Protestant regime. This shift undoubtedly angered the Catholics, who had been living relatively comfortably under Henry's more balanced approach. The real religious conflict began after Edward's death, when he tried to pass the crown to his Protestant cousin, Lady Jane Grey, in an attempt to maintain Protestant dominance. However, she was overthrown after just 13 days by Edward's older Catholic sister, Mary. Mary, the daughter of Henry and Catherine of Aragon, was a fervent Roman Catholic. She sought to reverse her brother's Protestant reforms and reimpose Catholicism, even burning many Protestants at the stake in her efforts. This earned her the nickname of Bloody Mary. The religious pendulum swung dramatically during her reign, leaving England in a state of religious turmoil. Protestants were relieved when Mary died in 1558 and her Protestant sister Elizabeth I ascended to the throne. Elizabeth I adopted a more moderate approach, similar to her father's. She famously declared, I have no desire to make windows into men's souls, indicating that she was more concerned with outward obedience than personal beliefs. However, due to numerous Catholic plots against her life, and reign particularly from the 1570s onwards, Elizabeth was forced to enforce Protestantism more strictly. Church attendance became mandatory and Catholicism was increasingly driven underground. Throughout the Tudor era, Protestant rulers oversaw the country's most celebrated achievements, like the defeat of the Spanish Armada, while Catholic rulers were associated with brutality 
and religious persecution, further tarnishing the reputation of Catholicism in England. Elizabeth faced constant threats from Catholic plots, including several attempts to assassinate her and replace her with her Catholic cousin, Mary, Queen of Scots. This led to Mary's execution in 1587 and heightened the suspicion and fear of Catholics in England. When Elizabeth I died in 1603, many Catholics in England were hopeful that her successor, King James VI of Scotland, would be more sympathetic to their cause. After all, he was the son of the Catholic Mary, Queen of Scots. However, their hopes were quickly dashed when James, a Protestant with little connection to his mother, continued the persecution of Catholics. He ordered Catholic priests to leave England and impose fines on those who refused to attend Protestant services. He also signed a peace treaty with Spain, further diminishing any hopes of a Catholic resurgence. By 1604, just a year into his reign, James had condemned Catholicism as superstition and intensified efforts to suppress the religion in England. This harsh treatment of Catholics set the stage for the gunpowder plot. The conspirators, led by Guy Fawkes and Robert Catsby, were desperate to put an end to Protestant rule and restore Catholicism to England. Their plan was not just an act of rebellion, but a desperate bid to reverse the religious tide that had been turning against them for decades. As the 5th of November 1605 approached, England was a nation on edge, deeply divided by religious tensions that had been simmering for nearly a century. The gunpowder plot was the culmination of years of frustration and persecution, a last-ditch effort by a small group of Catholics to turn the tide in their favour. The discovery and foiling of the plot would only serve to deepen the mistrust and hostility between Catholics and Protestants in England for generations to come. Number one, Guy Fawkes wasn't the mastermind. When people think of the gunpowder plot, the name Guy Fawkes instantly comes to mind. But did you know that Guy Fawkes wasn't the mastermind behind the plot? In fact, Fawkes was more of the muscle rather than the brains of the operation. He was the guy whose job it was to make sure it all goes boom. Boom! The real leader was a man named Robert Catesby, a charismatic and determined Catholic nobleman. Catesby was the one who devised the plan, recruited the other conspirators, and kept the plot alive despite numerous challenges. His motivations were deeply rooted in his faith, and his desire to see England return to Catholicism after years of Protestant rule under Queen Elizabeth I and King James I. Catesby had been involved in the Earl of Essex 1601 rebellion under Elizabeth I and found himself increasingly frustrated by the new king's lack of tolerance. Fawkes, on the other hand, was a soldier with extensive experience in explosives, making him the perfect choice to handle the logistics of the plot. While Fawkes has become the face of the gunpowder plot in pop culture, it's important to remember that he was just one of a much larger conspiracy orchestrated by Robert Catesby and his followers. Two, the plot was nearly discovered multiple times. The gunpowder plot was a high stakes game of cat and mouse, and it was nearly discovered on several occasions before the infamous night of November 5th. The conspirators had to keep their plans under wraps for months, and during that time, they faced several close calls. One of the most significant moments came when the plotters rented a cellar directly beneath the House of Lords. As they began to stockpile 36 barrels of gunpowder, 36, but last year, last year I had 37! They had to be incredibly careful not to arouse suspicion. There were several instances where workers and guards in the area noticed unusual activity. But somehow, the plotters managed to deflect the attention. Then, there was the infamous Monteagle letter. On the 26th of October, just days before the plot was set to unfold, Lord Monteagle, a Catholic nobleman, received an anonymous letter warning him to stay away from Parliament on the 5th of November. Monteagle passed on the letter which then led to an investigation. Despite this, 
It took them several days to act on the warning, and the plot continued to progress dangerously close to success. Number three, Guy Fawkes used a false name. In an age where secrecy was paramount, the plotters took every precaution to conceal their identities. Guy Fawkes, in particular, took on the alias John Johnson while working on the plot. He used this false name while posing as the servant of Thomas Percy, one of the conspirators who has secured the lease on the cellar beneath Parliament. Fawkes' use of the alias was a crucial part of the plot's success in remaining undiscovered for so long. It allowed him to move around relatively unnoticed, and it wasn't until his arrest on the night of November 4th that the authorities discovered his true identity. The use of false names and identities was a common tactic among the plotters, highlighting the level of caution and deception involved in their plan. The choice of John Johnson might seem almost comically bland, but it was a perfect cover in an era where such names were common enough to avoid suspicion. He also went under the name Guido Fawkes while he was in Spain, which isn't an alias, but I wanted to mention it. It was to mainly make him sound more Spanish and therefore more Catholic. Number four, he was born a Protestant. Guy Fawkes' exact date of birth is unknown. It is thought that he was born in around early April of 1570, as there are records showing that he was baptised on the 16th of April 1570 at St Michael Le Belfry Church in York. Guy was born to parents Edward and Edith. His parents were Protestants. Now, History Extra says that Guy had two sisters that lived to adulthood, Anne and Elizabeth, while Historical Royal Palaces said that Guy had two brothers called John and Christopher. And although both of these could be correct, neither source mentions the other set of siblings, and it's presented as if he had just brothers or just sisters. But that's not really important to the story. Anyway, at the age of eight, Guy Fawkes would lose his father, Edward. It's not clear nor really relevant how he died, but his Protestant mother, Edith, soon remarried to a Catholic man named Dionys Bainbridge. The young Guy Fawkes was intrigued by his stepfather's religion, and in the late 1570s, early 1580s, it was a dangerous time to be a Catholic in England, what with Elizabeth being excommunicated and the plots against her. But despite the danger up ahead, Guy converted to Catholicism. Guy attended St Peter's School in York, and after leaving school, he got a job in the household of Anthony Brown, Viscount Montagu. At the age of 21, Guy Fawkes went to mainland Europe to fight for Spain against the Dutch in what would be known as the Eight Years' War. It was while he was in Spain that Guy changed his name to Guido in an attempt to make him sound more continental and therefore more serious about his Catholic faith. And by 1605, he was also using the alias John Johnson. He would also develop his knowledge of gunpowder overseas, which obviously put him in good stead because in 1603 Fawkes had been promoted to captain in the Spanish military. According to his European allies he was a man of great piety, of exemplary temperance, of mild and cheerful demeanour, an enemy of broils and disputes, a faithful friend and remarkable for his punctual attendance upon religious observance. A pretty good review I'd say. Fawkes was also, supposedly, quite good-looking. He was tall and strong with a thick, reddish-brown hair, beard, and a majestic, magnificent... moustache. Moustache. And number five. The Houses of Parliament are still searched. Every year before the state opening of Parliament, a tradition dating back over four centuries is carried out with meticulous care. The yeomen of the guard, often referred to as beef eaters, conduct a ceremonial search of the Houses of Parliament. This practice stems from the infamous gunpowder plot of 1605, when Guy Fawkes and his fellow conspirators attempted to blow up the Parliament building in a bid to overthrow the Protestant government and assassinate King James I. The search, though now largely symbolic, is a solemn reminder of that dark chapter in British history. 
the year men of the guard dressed in their iconic Tudor style uniforms still carry out this ritual with great ceremony. Armed with lanterns, they thoroughly inspect the cellars and vaults beneath the Palace of Westminster, where Guy Fawkes once hid barrels of gunpowder. Although the search is no longer conducted with the seriousness of its origins, the act itself is steeped in tradition and continues to serve as a poignant homage to the vigilance that protected the nation from disaster. The search is performed before the reigning monarch arrives for the state opening, which typically takes place in November. This grand event marks the beginning of a new parliamentary session, where the monarch delivers the king's speech, or queen's speech, during a queen's reign, outlining the government's agenda for the coming year. The Yeoman's Search is one of the many time-honoured rituals that precedes this significant event, blending the nation's rich history with the pageantry and ceremony of the present day. Though purely ceremonial in modern times, the search of the Houses of Parliament by the Yeoman of the Guard remains a vivid connection to the past. It serves as a living reminder of the resilience of the British state and its institutions, ensuring that the story of the gunpowder plot and the lessons it taught are not forgotten. The gunpowder plot is more than just a tale of treason and conspiracy. It's a story of fear, faith, and the lengths people will go to for what they believe in. From the shadowy figures behind the plot to the mysteries that still surround it, this event continues to capture our imagination and remind us of the complex web of history. Next time you hear Remember, Remember the 5th of November, Think beyond the fireworks and bonfires. Remember the people, the secrets, and the untold stories that make this event one of the most fascinating chapters in British history. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this deep dive into history, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel for more fascinating stories from the past. Let me know in the comments what other historical events you would like me to explore. And as always, have a wonderful day.